Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. For the next couple of minutes, we are waiting to get all the attendees on board for listening to today's talk. And while we are waiting, um, I'm going to show a little bit what we are planning for the next funk lecture and as well the different plans that we have organized uh, at the IBS. For example, the first one will be the next funk lecture that will be on November 30. And it will be uh, by Juan Rocha and his call ecosystems or showing symptoms of resilient loss. And then please remember that the next VNL conference of the IBS will be in 2024 in Prague. Check everything. All information should be already posted online. And as well, before uh, we start, just a little reminder about how we're going to organize uh, today's lecture. Uh, so for questions and comments, uh, you will see on the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen, you will see the chat box, raise your hand icon, and then questions and answer box. So um, according to our experience, the best uh, option would be putting your questions on the question and answer box, like in here. And then if you wish to put the question yourself, just raise your hand and then we will uh, open the microphone for you and you can make the question directly um, to Nuria. Um, so I think, let me see the numbers of participants, how are they going? Uh, okay. We have a little bit, we still see the number coming up. Let's just wait a few, few minutes more. So I'm seeing that the numbers are getting stable. So uh, I think that is the right time to leave you with Miguel uh, to introduce uh, the speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this funk lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Nuria Galliana. Uh, Nuria studied uh, uh, in Barcelona at the uh, Autonomous University in Barcelona, where she studied environmental sciences. And then she also did a master's in ter terrestrial ecology and biodiversity management. She then moved to France to study ecology at the Center for Biodiversity Theory and Modeling in the French Pyrenees, where she did a thesis on tr trying to integrate spatial and biogeographical processes into species interaction networks. She then moved back to Spain to do a postdoc at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, in, again in Barcelona, before moving to, to, to Madrid for, to the Department of Biogeography and Global Change at the National Museum of Natural Sciences uh, as a Marie Curie Fellow. Uh, it is a pleasure to be colleague with Nuria, and we would like to thank her to, uh, for accepting this talk and um, go for it. Thanks. Thank you, Miguel, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here sharing some of the work that I've been doing. And I would like to mention that I, my background is in ecology, as Miguel just said, and is concretely on ecological networks, but I try to integrate them with the spatial processes and biogeography. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. 
So can you see my screen? Ah, yes. I'll go next to yeah. Okay. So originally ecological communities were thought to be mere collection of species where their presence was mostly determined by environmental factors. However, soon enough, they realized that the interactions with other species were also fundamental factors determining the structure and the composition of ecological communities. In fact, they realized that the species were not only interacting with other, another species, but that they were embedded in complex networks of trophic interactions, like the one that I'm showing you here, where every node represents a species and every link represents a trophic interaction. And after a few decades of research on ecological networks, we now know that um, there are some universalities in their structure and that this structure is key to understand many, many important facts, factors of community dynamics and different ecosystem functions. However, network research has mostly focused on local landscape scales, ignoring the processes operating at large spatial scales like climate. The region here is more the part related to biogeography. And however, the importance of a scale has been shown in many other fields of ecology, like for instance, how zooming out and integrating different habitats has been key to understand how the number of species increases with area, showing the species area relationship. Or for instance, how community stability increase, increases with area through different processes of synchrony. So it seems obvious that we need to see what's the effect of the spatial scale of observation for ecological networks. On the other side of this spectrum that I was showing you, biogeography usually focus on, focuses on large scale patterns, traditionally ignoring the importance of biotic interaction. However, there, there, there's been studies showing that there, are, there is variation in, in the structure of these ecological networks, like in this example here, where they showed that in the six main ecoregions of the world, you can observe different traffic structures. So it seems necessary to properly integrate ecological networks with different spatial processes at large spatial scales and by geography to properly understand the influence of um, process operating at large spatial scales on network structure, but also to see, to try to disentangle if the importance of biotic interactions for biogeographical patterns. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll start talking about the, the spatial scaling of ecological networks from a theoretical uh, approach and uh, analysis with data, empirical data. And then I will briefly talk about some stuff that I'm working on now that relate more to the second part that I was mentioning about trying to disentangle the effects of biotic interactions for by a geographical pattern. Okay, so let's start with the first part. And as I was mentioning before, you all probably know the, the species area relationship since it's one of the best known patterns in ecology, describing how the number of species increases as you increase the area, the area sample. But the number, as I was saying, species are not alone. They um, embed in complex networks of interactions. And the number of species is only one of the metrics that we can measure in a community. So we wonder how these other metrics that we can measure in an ecological community change with area size. And to start answering or addressing this question, we, we start with a theoretical approach 
where we try to explore different mechanisms that could lead to changes in network structure as you increase the area, the area size. And I won't explain all the mechanisms that we explored, but I will give you an example of the mechanisms that are, um, a mechanism that I think is quite intuitive. For example, if you have different species area across different traffic levels, which means that for a given traffic level, the number of species would increase faster than in another traffic in the other traffic levels, this could lead to changes in network structure. So what we did is to develop three different theoretical models that um, were targeted to explore different ecological processes that we thought could lead to changes in network structure. Today, I won't, exp I won't explain the different, all the, the models because maybe it's less fun, but if someone is interested in knowing the details about them, I'm happy to explain them later. But basically all three models allowed us to create networks at different scales based on different ecological processes. And we measured network properties at each of the, those spatial scales. For instance, one kind of properties that we measured on the networks is their vertical diversity how diverse they are vertically. Some of the, these measures of vertical network vertical diversity are, for example, the number of species per traffic level or the mean foot chain length, which is the mean number of paths that you need to go from the bottom of the network to the, the species at the top. And what we've seen is that in general, vertical diversity increases as you increase the area sample. So in this plot here, we have in the x-axis the normalized area, and in the y-axis here we have mean foot chain length. But in the following plots, we will have different network properties. Another thing that we looked is network complexity. So how complex is the network? For example, one metric of network complexity is the mean number of links per species. And what we've seen is that network complexity also increases as you increase the area size. Lastly, the, another thing that we measure from networks is their modular structure. For example, um, we, we analyze modularity that what it does is to look if in the network there are groups of species that are interacting more between themselves than among the other species in the group. Like in here, for example, we would have three different modules in this network represented with three different colors. And surprisingly, what we saw with the theoretical models is that the modular structure of the networks didn't seem to change across the area. So well, in this case, not some. But... And it's, here it's important to notice that for none of the um, theoretical models that we developed, we included um, habitat heterogeneity. And we think this is an important factor because it's easier to get modular structure, structure when you have habitat heterogeneity. But through all these examples of um, results that I just show you, showed you, I, I was only showing you the results for one of the models that we used, but what we observed is that the specific shape of the network area relationships um, depended on the, on the different models, change across models, which su suggested that depending on the ecological processes in a given place, we, the shape of the network area relationship would vary. And so this is one of the, conclu the conclusions that we extracted from this work is that potentially analyzing network relationships could allow us to identify the ecological processes at play in a, at, in a given place. Another um, conclusion that we extracted from this work is that 
as you might know, the species area relationship has been widely used as um, a proxy or to predict the effects of habitat loss in species richness. So now if we take a similar perspective and, and we think and we see that the number of links scales with area faster than the number of, of species, we might see that given a loss of habitat or an area reduction, we might be losing links before we start detecting the extinction of species. So we, which could have consequences for, for the ecosystem because it would lead to a community simplification that have, has further consequences for their stability and function. So, okay, all this was theoretical, but then we thought very nice, but how does this really look in nature? Is this, can we observe something similar in nature or how does it look in the real world? And to look at this, we ensemble through two different spatial interaction networks from different ecosystems across the globe. And we classified them in two different domains, depending on the spatial extent of, the, of each study. And for the regional domain, the data was collected in replicated, in local replicated samples and with a relatively narrow spatial extent, while the biogeographical domain consisted in studies that spanned large spatial extents, usually encapsulating different biomes. And what we did to build network area relationships is to, for example, for the regional domain, we would take one replicate, we would analyze the network structure at that in that replicate. Then we would take two replicates and we would analyze the network structure with the combination of these two replicates and so on until we have the full aggregation of all the replicates and we compute all these network properties that I'm showing you here in the red box. But today, well, in the following plots, I will only be showing you these four network properties. And here are the first results. Here, what I'm showing you is the spatial scaling of species, links, and links per species, for the data sets in the regional domain and the biogeographical domain at the bottom. And each color represents a different data set. And what we saw is that for all network complexity metrics, um, we saw a, a spatial scaling that followed a power function of the shape that I'm showing you up here. And it was nice that we observed this universality in the sense that they all follow this power function, but they also we also saw important differences in their shape. But I won't explain the details now. If you are interested, I can explain later. But we saw that the some of these differences were partially explained by the method methodologies used in in the different studies corresponding in the to the different domain. And this uh, network, mm, the scaling of the network properties that I just showed you were somehow expected because we already knew, it's widely known that the number of species scales with area. And in the network literature, it's also well known that there are many of the network complexity metrics that are well related with the number of species. But we it was still important to properly quantify and show. But we also observed other network metrics that we had no expectation for the spa their spatial scale, like the degree network degree distribution. The network degree distribution um, describes how the number of links are distributed across the species in the network. 
And here I'm showing you two examples, one for the regional domain and one for the biogeographical bi domain. And what the plots are showing are um, the cumulative degree distribution, which means that for one data set, it's showing the, probab the cumulative probability of finding a species in the network that has at least this number of links that, that are shown in the x axis. So, for example, here, the probability of finding a net, uh, species in the network that has one link is one because you will always find, find a species that has at least one link. And the different colors represent the different spatial scales for the same data set. So, here it's only one data set, and here it's also one data set. And the blue corresponds to the smallest spatial scale and the yellow to the largest spatial scale. And what we see here is that network degree distribution does the, the fundamental shape of the degree distribution does not change much across spatial scales. And here I only showed you two examples because it was easier visually, but we observe this across almost all data sets analyzed that the network degree distribution is preserved across spatial scale. And okay, so all this is nice, but now you can wonder, since we know that um, species richness scales with, with area and many network properties are related to species richness, how can we know that all these patterns are not only driven by the scaling of species richness with area. So what we did to do that is to perform different null models that I'm not showing to you today because it would be too much. But basically, this null model analysis allowed us to see that um, the real world networks, so the empirical networks that we analyzed, had a greater complexity than expected by chance or by our null model networks, that there are changes in network structure with area that cannot be explained by the changes in species richness alone. And that network degree distribution is a fundamental property of each ecosystem that it's very hard to predict based only on species richness and the number of links. So to sum up this part, we, we showed that basic community structure descriptors increase with area following a power function, that network degree distribution remains more or less constant with area. And it might be indicating that the fundamental organization of the interaction within the network is preserved across spatial scales. We've seen through the analysis of uh, the null models that the spatial scaling of network structure is not only determined by the scaling of the number of, of species with, with area and the number of links, there are factors beyond. And we believe that biodiversity area relationships can be extended from species counts to higher levels of network complexity, which um, can have consequences in the way we understand the effects of habitat destruction in, in our natural communities. And that's it for the first part. Now I would uh, go into the second part of the talk which is much shorter or a bit shorter, but I really wanted to show what I've been doing in my current postdoc, where I try to disentangle this, the importance of biotic interactions for large scale biogeographical patterns, because I think this can be a great audience for that. And so, okay, as I mentioned before, Biogeography is usually focused on describing large scale patterns, namely like species distribution, the distribution of the species. And it's traditionally thought that 
the distribution of a species is mostly determined by their environmental niche. So a species that has a wide environmental niche would have a wide distribution, while a species that has a narrower niche would have like a more narrow distribution space. And, but little is known about the importance of the diet niche of species in determining their, their distribution space. However, the ecological niche of the species is, is a multidimensional concept that encapsulates both the environmental factors and the biotic factor, the abiotic and the biotic factors. So we, what, what, I try to, to explore is the effect of biotic interactions in determining the range size, the geographic range size of the species. And to explore this question, we use a data on empirically sampled species interactions across more than 600 sites across Europe, each point of this plot are um, different sites. And for each site, we have empirically sampled interactions um, among these three different traffic levels. And the first thing that we do is to quantify a species environmental niche. Here, for example, if you look at the red points, if these red points would represent a, a species, it would have a very narrow environmental niche while if a different species would be distributed across these red points would have a wider environmental niche. And to quantify this properly, what we did is to use all the environmental variables that are available in the World Clean database. And what we did is to, to check um, in all the sites where a species was present, and we projected the environmental variables of those sites in a PCA analysis. And we, here in this plot, I'm showing you the example for two different species. And what we did to quantify the environmental niche is to calculate the area within these circles. So we consider the environmental niche of the species, the area within this circle. And here are the first results. Here in the x-axis, we have the range size of the species computed as the, as the total number of sites in which it's present. And in the y-axis, the environmental niche. And what we see is that there is a, a strong correlation between the two. As expected, species with wider environmental niche spread would have larger ranges. Okay, but the, the main objective of the of the project, of the study, would, was to, to disentangle the effect of, of biotic interactions, the, the effect of diet niche. And to do that, we measured the interactions each species has at different spatial scale. But today, I'm, I'm going to focus on this plot here that shows the relationship between brain size in the x-axis and the total number of interactions a species has. So, uh, as in the plot before that I didn't mention, each of these points is a species in the data set. And what we see here is also a strong relationship between species with wider diet niche and, and range size. So species with wider diet niche have larger ranges. Okay, very nice, but how, how, how do we infer causality? How, how can we know if they are in more places just because they are able to interact with more species or they interact with more species just because they are able to be in more places. It's, it's tricky to infer causality. So what we did to try to get answers in that direction is to again perform a null model analysis based on the number of sites in which species was present. So what we do is for each species, we check the number of sites in which it's present. We then randomly distribute the species in the corresponding number of sites. And then we check 
the resulting environmental niche of this random distribution and the resulting diet niche in the sense of number of co-occurring potential resources. And this is what we observe. So here in, on the left, we have the same plot as we've seen before, brain size in the x-axis and environmental niche in the y-axis. So the blue line is the exact same line that we were seeing before. But now in, the, in orange, we have the results of the null model. And what the, these results show us is that, um, that species in the real data, the species have narrower environmental niche than expected by chance, than expected from our, by our null model. But on the contrary, yeah, here is what I just said, um, based on the range size, yeah. But on the contrary, when we looked at the results of the null model for the diet niche, so in the null models, again, we cannot um, know the interacting species because we can only know the interacting species in the real data. So what we are looking at here is the number of co-occurring resources. And again, in blue, we have the real data and in yellow, the null model data. And what we see is that species have a larger number of co-occurring species in the real data than expected by chance. And this is interesting because it's kind of telling us that in the real data, um, species are trying to maximize the number of co-occurring species in, in a given site, while the environmental niche doesn't seem to be what's limiting them. So to sum up with this part, we've shown that both environmental and diet niche positively correlate with the species range size. But the null model analysis suggested that the diet dimension of the niche is more strongly limiting or might be more strongly limiting species rain size. And even I didn't show you the other plots related to the diet niche, but we observed that species with larger ranges had more interacting partners at both local spatial scales and continental scales. And also they have a larger turn turnover of resources across sites. So they are more generalist in terms of diet across different spatial scales. Okay, so as a general take home message, um, I would say that we showed that it's very important to consider the spatial scale of observation to properly compare ecological networks, because if we see that network structure changes with, with spatial scale, we, if we compare two networks that belong to different spatial scales, we don't know if the differences correspond to environmental factors or spatial scales. So it's very important to consider that. We've shown that network relationships could be important tools for conservation to see if we are simplifying ecological communities before even realizing that we are losing species. Then we also seen that biotic interactions can be important in determining large scale biogeographical patterns. And this might be more and more studied because we the high quality data on the species interactions across large spatial scales are, are increasing currently. And I also showed that it's quite challenging to disentangle the effect of biotic and abiotic factors. And finally, I would like to end saying that the integration between network research and biogeography is quite promising precisely because of what I was saying before that biogeography, I think, tend to ignore the importance of biotic interactions because we didn't have high quality data, but since now we have more tools and more data on that, we, we might start being able to answer some of these questions. 
and of course this work couldn't be possible without all the collaborators and people who shared data and that's all thank you for listening and i'm happy to answer questions if you have some